Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are. And welcome to the Alanos Group Broadcast Electronics HD Radio Solutions Webinar. I'm Chuck Kelly, your host, and I'm delighted to have with me Mr. Perry Priestley, the COO and CSO of Broadcast Electronics. Hi, Perry. Hi there, Chuck. And also Mr. Morton Simonson, the Chief Technical Officer of the Elanos Group. Morton? Yeah, hello, hello, Chuck. Delighted to be here. Nice to have you here from Copenhagen. So uh, first thing I've got to ask is how are you guys faring in the, you know, the pandemic? Are you sheltering at home safely? You and your family are well and safe and healthy? Yeah, well, from my side, uh, just outside of DC, everybody is safe, everybody's healthy, although we are lonely, we are bored, and um, we're looking forward to this to be, being over very soon. Yeah, yeah. Morten, how about you and your your family? Yeah, here in Copenhagen, in Denmark, we started opening up last week, and numbers are good, so even some more shops, even cafes and restaurants are opening up this week. Well, we're practicing self, uh, safe technology here on our webinar today. Each of us are wearing our masks. I know you can't tell, but we're so <laughs> glad you could be with us and, and, and uh, participate in the technology, even from a distance. So on the left side are the things we're going to generally talk about today. I think you're going to find it a very interesting webinar, particularly um, since uh, a lot of things we're going to talk about uh, uh, don't assume that you have a great deal of knowledge about HD radio and where we came from and how we got to where we are today. And uh, so it's going to be very interesting. In fact, some of you who are in the U.S. who may have encountered HD radio early on, maybe have forgotten how far we've come um, in the last decade or two. Anyway, the million dollar question. I always look forward to this part. Let me ask you, I, because it's thought provoking generally, let me ask you both. Why the heck do we need digital on radio anyway? I mean, analog has been working great for a hundred years. Did you want me to go first there? Fire away, Perry. I just, first of all, I just want to know when my original million dollar check is going to come in from the last. <laughs> don't, don't count on it, okay? <laughs> Not just yet. So I think the three key aspects of HD radio or digital radio is that, you know, the fundamentals, uh, you know, you get more stations, you get digital sound, and there's no cost, there's no subscription like those other um, systems. You know, from one FM frequency, one radio station can produce three additional channels, which right. means three, three times the revenue, three times the opportunity. And because it's digital, and this is what a lot of people don't like, you know, it's it, yeah, what's, what's wrong with analog, as you said, because it's digital, you're able to send data, song information, song title, artists, name, album art, you know, things like that. Uh, even even updates on traffic and weather. And there's even uh, there's even a technology now that allows uh, to give you, you know, the local fuel prices. So none of this would be available on analog. So it really comes down to digital. It, it's the future. Yeah. And you could do some of that stuff that you've been talking about with the web, but this doesn't take data. This doesn't cost it by the kilobyte. Correct. And it's available in your car. Yep. Yep. Morton, what do you think? I mean, you've been you've been through the digitalization of broadcast from the very beginning. I, I think I just said you're old. But anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> what what's your perspective on why radio needs to be digital? I think I can draw an uh, analogy to digital for TV and um, uh, the modulation scheme is certainly part of the equation so we have as long as we have um, reception that can be at least uh, error corrected to recreate the original signal it means that it is completely loss free so sound quality is if it is there then it is good and um, uh, the way it is modulated with COFDM is a digital scheme that is robust in the sense that the channel from the transmitter to the receiver uh, has been analyzed even for mobility for mobile reception in cars and understood to the extent that the modulation scheme and error protection mechanisms has been designed to combat the challenges of that sort of channel and that literally means that the signal 
is much more robust on the way from the transmitting antenna to the receiving antenna. Yep. yep. Furthermore, um, uh, and furthermore, since the signal we receive is completely uh, error-free, it means that the system is uh, deterministic and we can, as Perry pointed out, bury data and other things, but we can also do things like uh, single frequency networks. Uh, because noise is not an issue, we have a signal that is deterministic, and so we can take advantage, advantage of things like constructive um, uh, interference in SFN right. operations. So, so that SFNs work as seamlessly as they do with, say, modern digital cell phones. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Very good. All right. Well, I think that's a reasonable answer to my million dollar question. Let's talk about briefly how we got here at FMHD Radio. Back in 2002, uh, the FCC endorsed HD Radio as the digital system for the United States. And in 2007, it was five years later, that they added the capability to have multicasting and data casting services. So you could have more than one channel. Right. Barry? Yep, absolutely. Yeah, it was, and it, because it's a, uh, it's not uh it's it's a transitionary technology i mean you don't give up your analog signal to move to digital you can keep your analog viewers if somebody doesn't have an hd radio uh, receiver they can uh they can still hear your si single channel but if they do they move to they can have all the additional services uh, that you get with hd radio so it's a it's a really nice uh easy process for any radio station to implement yep and, and, you know, it, it's kind of crept up on us, I think, but there's 2,450 FM broadcasters offering HD radio in the United States, Canada, and Mexico, and additionally in other countries like Panama and the Philippines. Yeah, uh, really has uh, expanded. I think, obviously, the center is the U.S. Uh, it is where HD radio was invented. But in countries like Canada and Mexico, I mean, as an example, a lot of the automotive uh, automobiles for the US market are actually made in Canada. And yep. so initially, they're already going to have HD radios. And so a country like Canada, it's, it's natural for them to implement uh, HD radio as is as is Mexico. And, and you know, the receiver part of the equation has been the bane of digital radio since the very, very beginning. But we're finally getting beyond it. We've had 70 million HD radio receivers have been sold, 65 million of them are in cars so and and many people buy a new car and get hd radio and didn't even realize it had it and start hearing all these new stations that's absolutely right my wife did exactly the same she has a car with hd radio and it took a, a, a couple of weeks to find out that she actually had it um broadcast electronics i think was uh you know obviously very uh significant at the actual initial and implementation of HD radio in the US. They were one of the leaders, one of the pioneers. I think it was in the late 1990s, they implemented the first AM and FM stations and been in this industry for a long time. Uh, we're on the fourth and fifth generations of the product and uh, we're moving forward. Yep. All right. So let's see here. All right. So basically, um, Morton, you want to explain the basics of digital HD radio? Yes, I can give it an attempt. <laughs> so um, the idea is uh, to have coexistence with the uh, analog FM. That's the, should I say, the overall objective, which makes a lot of sense. Still mm -hmm. many cars around with uh, FM and still many FM receivers in general. And so to extend and provide the advantages that digital offer. Uh, it was decided to use uh, CUFDM, coded orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, which has by now proven itself uh, over time that it it is by far the most robust way we know today of transmitting uh, uh, high data rates over the air. And the uh, uh, multiple carriers of the CUFDM signal has been added to each side of the uh, analog FM signal. So uh, in the drawing, you see uh, the lower and the upper digital sideband, and there you see the illustration of the many carriers that are all modulated digitally. 
to tran to uh, transfer the bits from the transmitter to the receiver. Mm -hmm. And there has been an evolution where um, I don't know if it was out of a little anxiety or what, but in the beginning, the level that we were allowed to transmit digital was not very high, but that has gradually maybe uh, reflecting a shift towards a higher priority on the digital, it has gradually been allowed to increase the power so that today the digital is really a, a very well functioning system. Yep. yep. There are combinations where, um, but I don't know if it's too detailed for now, but there are combinations where you can adjust the injection level, you can even have a different level of the upper and the lower digital sideband. So you can kind of adjust the system to the situation you have at hand. Yep. Yep. Um, I think you have become a lot more flexible on what's allowed and uh, have, you know, over time uh, allowed the uh, system to be improved. Yes. I and think also, the other interesting thing about this is in the robustness of the system is part not only because of the fact that we're using uh, error corrected uh, COFDM data, but but in addition, the data in the lower digital sidebands, that is the left side of the graphic, and the upper digital sidebands, the right side of the graphic, is redundant. And so what it, what it means is that you could have some interference or some uh, frequency uh, uh, null um, in in one of those sets of sidebands, and the receivers continues to to play perfectly. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah I I get forty seven channels in the DC area of HD radio, um, and uh, the you know it's really crystal clear. It really does make a difference in terms of sound quality. Yep. Oh, and the fact that you can hear content that you can't get in analog. There just aren't the frequencies to get it. That's right. It's also amazing to see how the um, the coverage is about uh, the same for the analog and the digital, but still the digital needs only be so much lower in level compared yeah. to the analog to carry actually more information because the mm -hmm. bandwidth as such is not much larger. So. It's quite funny this coexistence of the two to illustrate how efficient digital transmission is. That's right. On the other hand, the flip side of the coin is the analog declines slowly off into oblivion and the digital goes to a point and then stops. Yes, that's that's the correct. difference, you know. The, cl the cliff edge. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, what does it take to transmit HD radio on FM? So the, the, the basic components that have existed since the beginning of, of, of HD radio, um, almost 20 years ago, the, there's the importer which multiplexes the audio content channels into a single stream. So you can have one, two, three, even four additional audio channels apart from the digital representation of the analog. And it multiplexes all of that together. Then there's the exporter, which assembles all that into an HD radio stream in what they call E to X form. Then there's the X gen, which creates the IMQ signal digitally from E to X data, which is fed directly to the direct to channel exciter. Now, interestingly, those first three that I've just mentioned, everything is digital. It comes in in AES EBU in digital form and it comes out as digital I and Q, and it's nothing but algorithms in between. Barry? Yep, and the director channel or DTC exciter, you know, takes that digital signal, synthesizes it directly to the final channel. It takes both the analog and the digital signal, uh, multiplies them up to the final RF carrier. There's no intermediate frequency, there's no IF. And so this lack of IF, this lack of multiplica multiplication, a lot of uh, extra crystal, crystal oscillators, et cetera, can, uh, well, it does improve the phase noise, and uh, it does improve the signal to noise ratio. So you're already getting a much cleaner signal at this point because you've got, because of this direct to channel exciter. And then the ability to take a sample from the output feed it back and generate what's called a pre-correcting signal, a signal that's equal in amplitude but opposite in, am in gain and phase so that you can generate this correcting signal and make what's you know so-called ideal signal to feed again into the final amplifier. So you can get a 
a digital signal, that, but that's also corrected for both linear and nonlinear distortions. Yep, and and that's a dynamic process. As changes occur, things warm up in the transmitter, or whatever, and the parameters change, the type of di uh, distortions and the and the character of those distortions change. The so as the the pre-correction signal will change and automatically correct for that. Yep, absolutely. Okay, so <laughs> this is a little bit of a history lesson. So this is where we came from. Early on in this process, there were four different methods of the amplifying process um, uh, for HD radio. Uh, really? There was, <laughs> what's that? It looks really complicated. I must well, say. it was. It absolutely was. And, and the top one is crazy. So I'll, I'll walk you through that. Those are all the BE part numbers, by the way, of all the bits and pieces <laughs> that went into this thing. The high-level combined method took an existing uh, FM analog transmitter and you know, with a Class C amplifier and all that sort of thing and added another whole transmitter just for the digital HD part. And then it put them through a, a, a combiner, but because the material was not on the same frequency, was not the same content, was not in the same amplitude, was not the same phase, there was a lot of reject power going out. And it, that reject power was 11% of the analog power going up in heat and 90% of the digital power going up in heat. You can imagine what a kludge that was. <laughs> yeah, it certainly is not green. <laughs> and and then there was the separate antennas method, which makes all the sense in the world. You get rid of that injector and instead feed those two independent transmitters, the two antennas with similar coverage. And I say similar because nothing is ever the same. And as you drive around in the coverage, the ratio of the digital signal received to the analog receiver signal received changed. And and that meant you had problems. Either the digital signal was too loud and interfered with the analog or the analog signal was too loud and interfered with the digital. So that was also difficult. Then there was split level combined, which is a proprietary system, which offered increased efficiency over high level combined. And eventually there was also something called low level combined, where we fed both the analog and the digital signals into a single more or less linear amplifier. And, and that worked, but it was very inefficient because that meant you were using class AB for FM, for FM analog. And, uh, but there was something coming in, in history that, that changed even all of that. And that was the injection level. As Morton mentioned a second ago, there was a change in the injection level allowed by our regulator, regulator here in the United States. In 2008, the FCC allowed all stations to increase from minus 20 dBC uh, up to minus 14 dBC, a 6 dB improvement for all stations, and up to 10 dBC for stations without adjacent channel interference issues. This made a huge difference because um, HD radio wasn't achieving the same kind of digital coverage as it was in analog, and that was due to a number of different things, but part of it was the noise environment we all live in today. I mean, that's 10, time, 10 times the digital power. That's quite yeah. a lot, quite an increase. But, but even though that sounds massive, that means you're going from 1% up to a possible 10% of the analog power. Yep. So it's not, it's not huge money. It's not huge money, not huge power. And they also, in that uh, rulemaking, also allowed asymmetrical sideband power. So if I only had an adjacent station on the frequency just above mine, which I was potentially going to interfere with, but not on the frequency below mine, I could actually raise my injection power to a higher level on the lower frequency rather than the higher frequency. And this, by the, the, the change in all of this and the effect of this higher uh, uh, ratio of digital power to analog power, effectively uh, eliminated the use of high level combined, split level combined, and, and the antenna, separate antenna systems. And everybody, all the manufacturers, broadcast electronics, and all the others, uh, focused on improving the efficiency of the low level combined system because it was the only thing that made sense going forward. And that's what we did. So, so there's another, there was another problem. <laughs> the whole <laughs> thing, the whole thing was, was a science project. Um, early installations of HD radio 
were amazingly complex. And you you brought in consultants to 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 wave their magic wands and make it work because you had lots of different boxes, many user interfaces, lots of IP addresses, routers. It was it was a science project. It was anything but intuitive. And as the technology has evolved and improved, uh, things have gotten somewhat better, but it can still be a daunting thing. Um, now with the integration of components, the importer and the exporter in the same box, the XGen in the same box with the digital adaptive uh, exciter, um, it's become much, much easier. And eventually, you know, hopefully, we're going to get to the point where all components are in a single box and you'll have all the audio inputs on one side via IP or ASEBU and RF out out of the other, like an RF server. And this will be cheaper, more reliable, and far easier to install and maintain via a single user interface. And frankly, this is what the Elanos Group is dedicated to doing. So, Perry, let's talk about the BE solution and the, and yeah. the, the way we've evolved. Past, present, and future. So in the past, you just explained, we had many boxes, many connections, many IP addresses, and uh, you know, quite, a, quite an installation uh, problem. Uh, and you know, when you have a complicated system, it's more complicated to maintain, upkeep, and, and keep it in perfect con condition. So the, you know, the first systems had five boxes, importers, exporters, exchins, a ch uh, direct channel exciter, or sometimes not even a direct channel exciter. The new generation, the present one, includes a you know, basically down to three boxes. So you have a separate importer exporter fed to a combined uh, exgen and digital uh, uh, direct channel exciter, and then the ultimate, the future generation, which um, Morton is working on right now, as we speak, uh, one box that does everything, digital on one side, RF on the other, much more, uh, I guess, much simpler, much, very much easier to install, uh, makes life easier. And because it's all in one box, let's just say it's going to be a lot less expensive. So at the end of the day, less expensive, easier to install. The difference, the, the cost difference of going to digital is going to be much less of, a, of an issue in two ways, both in terms of initial purchase price and operating cost. And that's as a result of the PAPR technology and the adaptive pre-correction technology improving the efficiency of the PA. So you have much less electrical running costs, much higher efficiency. Okay, Morton, tell us what you've been working on here. Yeah. <clears throat> we are working along two lines for the time being. Um, the the first one is um, to to make a solution with the importer and the exporter. As Perry mentioned in the previous slide, initially we will make this as a separate product in a separate um, uh, one U rack unit, like illustrated here. This will be a fourth generation. <laughs> From experience, fourth generation uh, importer exporter. Um, it will be embedded with the GUI and and SNMP, all the things that you or many of you might know from our products. Uh, it will have the uh, capability to adjusting the diversity <laughs> delay between the analog FM and the HD, so that uh, switching over in case it is needed from HD to analog will happen without interruption of the service. And compared to the products that uh, Elena's group uh, offer uh, with BE today, uh, we are looking at, a, uh, probably Perry should say this, but correct me if I'm wrong, Perry, I expect <laughs> that we are looking into a significant, significant cost reduction of this product. Yeah, I, th I think we're really just heading to, heading to the point where when you buy an analog transmitter, an analog FM transmitter without HD radio, it's going to cost about the same as a digital. And so what's, you know, why not go digital? Even if you don't implement it immediately, you've got a full HD ready system uh, that can be switched on at any time uh, in one box. Uh, so yes, there, I think the cost, the cost is going to become irrelevant uh, and it's, mule, it's purely down to a business decision of the radio station. Yeah, good point. Certainly um, coming to the next product, which is um, 
the X gene and the X uh, This one will be based or is based on the Pro Television platform. So hardware-wise, it's a product proven with uh, I think far beyond 40,000 installed units in daily operation. And uh, again, we are looking at a fourth generation um, of the X gene from Xperia. But we are certainly enhancing this with our own technologies and uh, doing all the nursing and caring and special tricks that we have accumulated knowledge about over the years. Uh, especially the field of the adaptive um, pre-correction is significant for the efficiency now that we will be forced to move away from potentially class F FM transmitters to more linear transmitters. There's really a competition uh, it's a strong competitive parameter to be able to extract high efficiency because uh, the electricity bill is a significant cost of operating a transmitting network. Sure. And um, this product, uh, ironically, right now it is uh, completely ready from the HD side, but we are still porting the FM, <laughs> believe it or not. <laughs> but that is a, a matter of relatively brief time. But it's true, uh, Perry, I mean, FM is an integral part and the exciter can happily go on air FM only and then it's just a matter of turning on the HD at any one time and, uh, and so to engage the digital together with the FM. So both products are going to be software defined uh, and so it's a matter of uh, it's really will be the same hardware whether you buy uh, buy an analog or a digital exciter and then you just uh, upgrade if you want to go to HD in the, in the future. Yeah, that's true. In fact, it's the very same uh, hardware that is doing ATSC3 today. <laughs> yes, exactly. The same as from ATSC1 to ATSC3. It's yeah. the same kind of switch. Who wants to explain advanced adaptive pre-correction? Why is the BE LMS Group solution unique? You go ahead, Perry. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, you did all the development. I just watch on in awe. Um, <laughs> so basically, you know, any amplifier that you want to push into a from a class A to a class A B, and ultimately further, the more you push it, the more it takes it closer to saturation. The more sine wave will turn into a square wave, and the square waves are made up of hot odd harmonics out of phase. So this, the drawing here on the top right hand corner shows PT, which symbolizes the two side bands on an uh, HD radio signal. And because you have two side bands and you're feeding those, it's like a two-tone test into an amplifier, you will generate third and fifth uh, order har harmonics. Uh, that's It's just a natural thing. It's just what happens with every amplifier that's not perfectly linear. These harmonics, of course, are going to cause distortion. They're going to interfere with other radio stations, and they're going to interfere with your uh, your own FM signal, significantly reducing its coverage, significantly uh, reducing its performance as well. And the last thing you want to do is go HD and make your analog FM sound worse. So uh, what you need is a, a system that is able to generate the same intermodulation products, the IM3 and the IM5, both upper and lower, you need something to generate uh, a signal that comes back from the output that is equal and opposite in amplitude and phase, and so that you can generate what I mentioned before is a correcting signal. And that correcting signal will cancel out these intermodulation products, and uh, you should be left with just the PT signals, i.e. the two uh, HD radio sidebands. Excellent. And, and you know, this is this part, this screen here is not really unique. I mean, all digital radio transmitter manufacturers employ adaptive pre-correction today. However, the system we've developed, the broadcast electronics and the LNOS group, is far more advanced. So here we go. Morton, want to explain this? Yeah. <clears throat> this is basically showing the scheme how to, you, you hook it up, not the inter internal workings. But um, uh, I think the first point is to notice that uh, you will see two feedback paths. There's one after the amplifier and there's one after the output filter, whether it's a low pass or a band pass filter. Uh, the reason we have these two um, couplers 
is that the pre-corrector in the overall blocks consist of two main blocks. There's first the linear pre-corrector and then there's the non-linear pre-corrector. The linear pre-corrector compensates for magnitude and group delay errors in the bandpass filter or the low pass filter. And that means that uh, the channel is uh, equalized even though we might have steep slopes on this filter, the channel is equalized so that it is completely amplitude and phase linear. This actually also improves the FM to some extent because oh, yeah. the, the FM is also uh, passed through the very same filter. This is uh, uh, what we call um, linear signal processing. So that means the linear pre-corrector its function is a linear transformation of the signal so that it is, a, you could argue, the reciprocal of the transfer function of the, of the bandpass or low pass filter. Mm -hmm. uh, it adapts itself automatically um, and continuously, uh, but mind you, in reality, once these filters are at, um, at a stable operating temperature, they tend to be pretty static. Mm -hmm. um, the other pre-corrector, which is uh, a lot more complicated, the uh, magnitude's more complicated than the linear pre-corrector, is the non-linear pre-corrector. And this is um, the point that uh, Perry already described to some extent. This is when we see, we feed the signal through an amplifier and uh, the amplifier uh, receives this signal of quite some bandwidth and it is at the same time expected to reproduce the signal with high integrity even though there's a lot of frequency content in the signal and consequent of that are these distortions that Perry mentioned but there are also other mechanisms producing uh, distortions one is uh, clipping if you try to approach the saturation of the amplifier, which uh, ideally you like to because you want to have the high efficiency as possible. Furthermore, uh, bias circuits and other circuits, especially the semiconductors, they have um, a non-linearity which is not only related to um, time here and now, but also they have a memory effect, which means that uh, for instance, for the transistor, the um, uh, the characteristic behavior of the transistor is different if it has been in saturation or not. And that means that the pre-corrector has to do a pre-distortion, so the opposite behavior of the uh, transmitter, even under the circumstances that memory plays a role. And for this, there has um, uh, been a lot of research going on and luckily uh, it has been analyzed quite some years ago, approximately 100 years, the framework, the mathematical framework was established in uh, by Volterra, an Italian mathematician. Uh, and this framework actually can work on any black box time domain nonlinearity with uh, memory effects. And this we have actually seen. Uh, I can a little bit uh, give you an indication by saying the actual pre correction circuit, so the part of the pre corrector which is in the signal path, the part that the IQ signal passes through to be processed so that it on the output uh, has this anti-phase distortion of the amplifier. That circuit by itself we have not changed in maybe eight years because that implements the basic mathematics of this um, Volterra functionality. But the software that calculates the coefficients can constantly be refined. And part of my life for many, many years has been to do refinements to this software. And the better we are capable of calculating these coefficients, the better the circuit will behave. But I think it is uh, at least to 
a technical nerd than, than like me, it is interesting to notice that the hardware circuit itself has been constant for such a long period of time, uh, showing kind of the inherent correctness to the to the concept of Volterra. And we can still improve and we are still considered absolutely state of the art and it has not stopped. There will be constant improvements. Physics is still physics. Physics is still physics, <laughs> but you uh, literally, I can tell you, um, uh, on the computer, uh, on our embedded processor, we can calculate with 32 bits of precision. Wow. On my uh, laptop, I can calculate with 64 bits, but part of the algorithm is so sensitive to the uh, numerical precision of the calculations that I use a uh, specially implemented numerical system which currently calculates with 512 bits in wow. some of the significant uh, calculations. So so one way of saying, you, you said that the basic algorithm was developed 100 years ago, and it could be said that at that point in time, the calculations were being done with a slide rule, and today they're being done with a cray. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> yeah, but many things have been invented before it is physically possible to do it. That's exactly right. Okay. Yeah. One of the other things that makes our solution unique is that we are implementing and proposing to implement the ATSC3 standard for the STL protocol, known as the A-324 standard. And what makes this very unique? Uh, we're ATSC3 is a television standard. We're implementing it for radio in our um, exciter. Is it has several features that are very important. Number one, it can be configured to carry multiple audio and data streams. It can, can be configured obviously for video as well, but we don't care for that right now in radio. It includes provisions for precise timing through the STL stream which helps us both in SFN applications and to minimize the dynamic changes in the ratio of analog digital timing, making sure they stay synchronized in the receiver. And then it also provides, and this is I think very important, end-to-end -end IP security provisions to minimize the chance of having the STL hacked. And it allows for redundancy in the content so that part of the stream could be interrupted and the rest of it could be backed up. The, the unique thing about what we've done here is because we're basing our radio exciter on the pro television RF supercomputer, which is being used already and has been for several years in ATSC3 service, we can take that code that was developed for ATSC3, port it right over into our HD radio exciter, and we're good to go. Now, how is this important to you? So far, nobody, no manufacturer in the studio space, that would be the audio processors and things like that, have implemented this. But we have indications from various audio processor manufacturers that they're in, interested to implement this technology on the studio side as well. And then it's going to become a very, very easy process to implement these features uh, for radio in the STL function. So we're very excited about this as an opportunity for radio. Excellent. Okay. Morton, this is your baby, the RF supercomputer. Can you explain? <laughs> it's not really a computer. I mean, there's no window screen or, or blue screen of death. It's an embedded processor, but somehow we had to communicate. There's a heck of a lot of mathematical processes going on here. Yeah, that's true, Chuck. It's an... Uh, it's the third generation hardware wise of a concept we envisioned um, uh, around maybe a year or two after the first uh, digital TV networks, when we realized that the different countries would be making different uh, standards. We thought, well, this is the way digital is going to go. We don't want to make a new piece of hardware and software equipment for each. and uh, every one of the digital standards, we need a platform concept that can do everything. So we try to anticipate whatever might come in the future. And that of course took a while. Uh, I'm a little bit proud to say that uh, we, we did it almost better than we believed ourselves possible because the platform 
stays with us and there has not yet been a waveform created that we have not been able to uh, implement on this platform. Uh, yeah, it consists of many parts and I should try maybe not to be uh, going into too much detail so you There's have nicely written. <laughs> we've actually got a webinar that's with you that explains it in immense detail and people can go back that's and see true. that webinar if they like. That's very true, Jock. Here I'll just run through the list that uh, is on the slide. So there is a programmable hard real-time processor. Uh, by hard real-time, it is to be understood that, that there is a, a deterministic uh, time-wise behavior of the software on this hard real-time processor. So if, for instance, we have to mute the signal in case of too high reflected power, we can guarantee the time it will take to activate that mute function. Then we have an embedded uh, Linux processor running a real-time Linux kernel, and uh, there we can do uh, multi-threaded uh, programming. There's also a programmable digital signal processor, and there's quite a large programmable FPGA. And all these devices, they can move large amount of data in between them as background processes. So that means we can distribute any thinkable algorithm where parts of the algorithm lends itself maybe more to the DSP or more to the FPGA or more to the Linux. It can all be distributed and the data transfer between the different parts of such an algorithm can happen without burdening the processing power of the different processing devices. Um, so all this is implemented on this board and it is all configured uh, through software with what we call software images. So you can take an HCSC tree modulator and load a new software image on it and then it will become for instance an AD, HD radio modulator exciter. Mm -hmm. So you go from TV to radio. <laughs> yeah that is kind of weird isn't it but it's actually That's incredible. exactly what it does. It's completely mm -hmm. defined through the software. Uh, briefly the PCB is a 16 layer with uh, more than 2200 parts the RF output is from 30 megahertz to 760 megahertz in one hertz steps. It has four gigabit Ethernet ports, each with individual MAC address. That is important in case you want to have real redundancy with the IP distribution. It has an uh, optional module with uh, GPS and GLONASS, Galileo, and Beidou. Actually, it can run any combination of two of these uh, standards simultaneously. So there are two radio channels to this uh, GPS module and it switches uh, from one to the other without interruption of the timing. It can be supplied with uh, a single voltage that has to be in the range of 5 to 50 volts. And uh, there's an onboard uh, web server with a GUI that uh, we actually had a GUI expert uh, uh, of, a, should I say, softer education than uh, our people here, running around for half a year observing how we <laughs> operate the equipment and so on, and gave us recommendations as to how to make all this complicated stuff work in an intuitive way. Um, and uh, finally, I should maybe say because for digital, a significant parameter is the quality of the reference oscillator. Everything on this board is synchronous to one single oscillator. And uh, especially if we are talk talking single frequency networks, it becomes important if synchronization to the, the GPS signal is lost, how stable and with how low phase noise we can stay on air. And for this, we offer three levels of oscillators. Um, yeah, and then uh, currently we support the, the standards written here. So these are software images and anyone can be exchanged even in the field from anyone to anyone. <laughs> uh, 
the DVB standards, DVB T, H, and T2. HCSC, what we today call legacy, but which is the 8VSB. Uh, the 8VSB even extended with the SFN and the MH. Uh, and then there's the HCSC 3.0, ISDBT for Japan and Brazil, Analog, PAL, and NTSC, DAB, TDMB, DAB, and now the HD radio, as soon as we, as I mentioned earlier, ironically finishes the porting of our FM. Probably the easiest part of the whole thing. Yes, I know, Chuck, don't blame me. But... <laughs> no, I'm not. It's so, ironic, you know? <laughs> but the nice thing, of course, with respect to this platform concept, which has proven itself valuable to our customers, is that in case new features or new requirements, even customer-specific requirements, should arise at any time in the future, the fact that the product is software-defined means that it can adopt to any future specification or requirement that might appear. Exactly. And in that case, we supply a software image and it can be uploaded even remotely. And so, you know, Sunday night at three o'clock when no one is listening or watching, it takes 20 seconds of downtime, down, uh, not on air time, and then it is up again with the new feature set. Fantastic. I think it's, it's, so you buy into the future because the hardware is not the limiting factor. Exactly. And software can adapt yeah. it to anything thinkable. I think it's a nice security, it's a nice uh, insurance policy when you have a uh, operating a transmitting network that you know that you can uh, adapt very easily to what the future might require of you. Absolutely. Yeah. Flexibility is incredible there. It's really impressive. Yeah, and very that's... people don't don't like to carry test equipment around anymore, but we we have to embed a lot of it right into the system so that people can see what's going on in a relatively complex system. Yes, yeah, with uh, what we're planning to do as a, a release of our new HD radio product line, any high power uh, transmitter will come with what I consider this uh, eye candy, basically. Uh, but it is, so it is some nice test equipment. You can see here on the right hand side the uh, HD radio spectrum, both in um, frequency and in a time domain. Uh, you can also measure the analog signal, the stereo quality with the stereo monitor. It provides all the RDS information. It actually has a nice feature that it measures the signal-to-noise uh, signal ratio of the analog signal so mm -hmm. that you can, you can switch on and off the HD signal just to make sure there is no effect on the FM carrier. So, and you can do that while you're on the air. You don't actually have to switch it off to measure the signal-to-noise. So, sure. A nice feature set. Uh, as I said, eye candy, a uh, nice little feature for any anybody looking to buy a high-power HD radio transmitter. Awesome. Okay. So let's see here. So in general, in summary, our HD radio solutions are the latest in a long line of reliable, efficient, and performance-leading digital technology from Broadcast Electronics and the Elenos Group. Uh, which has 90 years of corporate experience, over 60,000 installations, and some exciting new products for all radio stations. And we're here to be of assistance. Contact your BE representative worldwide to find out how cost-effective our HD radio solutions can be. And reminding you that you can register for our complete set of upcoming free webinars and watch webinars we've already done uh, that have been archived at www.elenosgroup.com forward slash webinar. Now it's time to answer whatever questions may have been asked. Let's take a peek here. We have one question from a friend in Canada. It says, why not stop making analog only transmitters and focus only on HD radio? It's kind of the opposite of the million dollar question. Does there, <laughs> need, to, does there need to be analog anymore uh, going forward? Or, or can we, because the price is so similar, can't we just make digital transmitters they can run them in analog only mode if they so desire or go ahead and turn on the hd radio feature set i think that's a that's a great question and it's to the point where we have got to i think the answer is yes um our transmitters in a sense will be digital radio transmitters whether mm -hmm. you 
whether you switch on the Xperia license uh, HD radio signal or not is entirely up to the customer. But when you buy uh, a B transmitter, it will be digital, analog, or both. It's up to you. So it's and, good I, and I think I think the the interesting thing is here that that. Uh, all transmitters need to be digital ready because you may be convinced that in your marketplace, in your market conditions, HD radio is not for you today. But are you so sure that during the entire life of that 20 year long life of that transmitter, you're not going to want to use digital? I think that's a much more difficult question. So it's better to have digital ready uh, right from the get go. There right. does appear like there's one last minute question. Let me see if I can get to that. What prevents out of building signals from coming back into the feedback loop? Good question. Morton, can you answer that? Um, Chuck, would you be kind to repeat the question? I'm not yep, sure. It I says, it. What prevents out of building signals, that is, other transmitters not associated with your transmitter, from coming back into that feedback loop? Because we're, we're looking at the, the, the feedback and bringing it back into the transmitter. Yeah. Nothing more prevents it that, than um, assuming that we are transmitting at a higher level <laughs> out of the antenna than what goes in. But, but isn't it true? Isn't it true that the directivity of the uh, of the sample uh, helps to prevent and minimize the other signals from coming back? Absolutely. Uh, the the correlation of the sample with itself yep. is is very very robust towards yep. these kind of disturbances. Okay. So, so luckily, luckily, especially for the digital, they are they are so unique, and since we generate the reference, we generate the signal ourselves in the stomach of the exciter, we know exactly what to look for, and yep. hence, hence the immunity to noise is inherently quite high. Yeah, I mean, from a practical point of view, I, I think I must have done at least two or three hundred stations with digital correction feedback, and at not one time was there external interference. If there is, it's usually something to do with the cable not being connected properly or not being grounded or, you know, or using the wrong kind of directional coupler. But 99% of the time, it shouldn't be an issue. We have one more question that's just come in. How do we get to convert the station that's on the air with hybrid HD today and make it all digital in the future? Turn off the analog and, and have many more content channels on the on the station uh, in the digital. How how do we how do we change the whole package to to run in all digital form? Martin? Yeah, I I'm not a, uh, into all the details of this, but the standard provides a provision for actually filling up the space that is occupied the, by the FM today also with digital. Right. And so basically, uh, it's another software load. It's an for for us. It's another software. Yep. But th things might very well be more complicated when you look to it uh, power-wise and RF-wise. And this I have not yet studied very much. So those aspects of it, uh, I would have to be the answer, Owen answer. But for, for sure, from because modulation PA, is a piece of software. Yeah. From from a PA standpoint, a PAPR, I should say, standpoint, you're, you're not going to get as much power out of the amplifier that was doing hybrid as you would when you're doing digital, all digital. However, uh, you don't need as much power because of the digital advantage. The coverage, yeah. a, a smaller power digital signal goes a lot further than an analog signal. Yeah, exactly, Chuck. But, but the exact numbers, uh, you probably remember how hard it was with the uh, TV switching from analog to 8VSB and uh, the promises of exactly how far it goes and so on. Yeah. So. Based yep. on that experience, I would be a little careful. It's true there are things pointing in each direction, yep. but the re the real exact number, I think, still remains to be seen in uh, in practicality. Well, we've we've right. gone over we've gone over our our uh, time. I, I, I apologize if we're not able to get to your question. We know how valuable your time is. We're honored that you chose to spend some time with us. Um, for Morton Simonson, Perry Priestley, I'm Chuck Kelly, thanking you for spending time with us today. And uh, thank you, gentlemen, for being with us, too. Thank you very much. Appreciate it, Chuck. Take care, thank everybody. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Uh,